So we are starting a new series today called Heroes. And uh, this is the second time that we've done this series. And uh, so we're going to be changing it up. And th so this is not a repeat, but this is a repeat of the theme. So it's, and it's based upon this verse in Hebrews. And um, it says, therefore, wait for it. There we go. And uh, so in the previous chapter, we kind of name it the Hall of Fame of Faith. And so if you want to read a really fun chapter, go read Hebrews 11. And it just goes character after character. And, and it talks about how by faith they did things. That when they believed in God, their life changed. It's a very cool chapter. But then it transitions from that hall of fame of faith. Um, Moses and Abraham and Noah and all these great amazing people. And then it says, since we are sur surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, those people are now in heaven. And you may not have known this, but this verse clearly says that they're watching. It's creepy, huh? They're up there in the stands and they've got pom-poms in hand and they're looking at us here on earth running our races and they're cheering for us. And it says, since they're there, let us, run, let us throw off everything that hinders and every sin that easily entangles. In other words, we have to seriously consider how they did it. So that we can win like they won. It, so that we can take their advice. It says, let us run with perseverance our race. The, mar the race that is marked out for us. So what we learn from that verse is that these great, amazing people are encouraging us in our race. And so what they're saying is, hey, here's what I did. Do this. Here's what I learned. Do this. The issue is that when you've got a crowd like that and it's, and it's roaring, you can't hear individual voices. If you go to a stadium and everybody's cheering, you hear the crowd, but what you don't hear is the individual voices. So I kind of had this thought. What would it be like if one of them came down out of the stands and onto the field with us? And what if that one Bible character just took one lap in our life race with us? What would they tell us? What would be the one thing that they would tell us out of all of the things that they learned? And so that's what we're going to do in this series. We've done it before. And so this installment of this series, we've got brand new characters but if they came out of the stands and they could run a lap with us and said, hey, Micah, keep running. And here, what would he, what would he or she tell me? And so there's a couple of benefits to this. One is, is that we're going to get really encouraged in this series. Secondly, we're going to learn our Bibles. We're going to dig into the life of these characters. And I'm going to do my best to pull out things that you would maybe not have known on the surface. So we can learn our Bibles a little bit more. Okay, so today we are bringing down out of the stands Moses and we pick up the story of Moses in Exodus and in the book of Exodus that book of Exodus picks up the storyline from the previous book Genesis which ended with Abraham's grandson Jacob who had a large family of like 70 people and he brings all these people down to Egypt in the middle of a famine. And Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, had been elevated to the second in command over all of Egypt. And he saved all of his family from the famine. So Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, allowed this whole, this large family to live there as a, in, as a safe haven. So eventually, all these people die. And about 400 years pass. And that's where we pick up the story of Moses. See, the old Pharaoh passes away, and now there's a new Pharaoh. And this new Pharaoh does not remember Joseph's family, the Hebrews, and what they did to save, uh, save Egypt from the famine. So centuries pass, and, the, and Joseph's family, the Israelites, the Hebrews, have, have multiplied. And they're filled the land. And so Pharaoh is concerned because this Israelite group, this race is a threat to their power. So Pharaoh attempts to destroy the Israelites. He brutally enslaves them and he, and he forces them into labor. So that, and then says all the Israelite boys be drowned in the Nile. Because the population is growing too fast and he's, and he's scared. So now Pharaoh is the worst character in the Bible so far that we've met. And his kingdom epitomizes hu the humanity's rebellion against God. And he so redefined good and evil according to his own interests that even the murder of innocent children has become good in his eyes. And so now Israel is crying out for help to God against Pharaoh and God responds with the birth of their deliverer, Moses. 
And Moses is born under this law that all the males had to be drowned. So Moses' mom, she puts Moses into the Nile River, but in a basket in order to save him. So he flows safely right down into the arms of Pharaoh's daughter who adopts him. So Moses grows up in, in Pharaoh's house, and that had to be a pretty sweet deal. I mean, I imagine living in Pharaoh's house was a, was a pretty good gig. I mean, if, if, if I want something to eat, I can go to the refrigerator or the cupboard and get something. But as the, as the son of the Pharaoh, I imagine the cupboard comes to you, right? I mean, it was, it was a pretty nice deal for him. And so Moses, in Exodus 2.11, it says that one day after Moses had grown up, he goes, he goes out to where his own people were and watched them in their hard labor. And he saw a, an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And I guarantee you that that was not the first time that Moses had seen this kind of event take place. I'm sure it was commonplace. But there was something that day that rose up on the inside of Moses. And we're, we're not sure if he knew at this point that he was the deliverer of Israel. But we do know that he knew that he was an Israelite. And so, and so in verse 12, looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. So what happens from here is that he finds out somebody has seen him kill this Egyptian. And so he, he's made this big mistake, and so what he does is he runs. He flees out into the desert. He's about 40 years old at this time, and he stays out in the desert for another 40 years, hiding from what he had done. And obviously ashamed from his past, afraid. And so Moses, see, has been, he grew up in, in Pharaoh's house. He killed the Egyptian. He's rejected. He's, he's fled to the desert. He's met a group of people that he loves. They bring him in. He gets married. Then he works for his father-in-law. And he's working life. He's living life as a shepherd. He's about 80 years old when we pick up the story here in Exodus. And it says that, he was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And, um, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there, the angel of the Lord, and this is important to know, because that phrase that, to many theologians, the angel of the Lord, it's not just an angelic being, but it's actually Jesus manifesting himself before he came to earth as a man. That's what most theologians believe. It was the only angel that allowed people to worship it or him. So then, um, so then this, Jesus appears to him in flames of a fire within a bush. And Moses saw that although the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why is that significant? Because the bush being on fire, is not, that's not significant. In that area of the world, it's extremely dry. It's very dry. And so for bushes to just instantaneously combust and to catch on fire is not unusual, actually. But what's interesting is that the bush is not burning up. And then when the Lord saw that he had Moses' attention, Moses had gone over to look. God called from him within the bush. And, um, and so when the Lord saw what, that he had come over, God calls him to the bush. And, he, and then he says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Which is not what I would have said. Because if a bush is speaking to me <laughs> that's on fire, I would not say here I am. I would say there I was because I'm out of here. But anyway, Moses hangs out, and God says in verse 5, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Taking off your sandals, and that day was a symbol of honor and humility. And then verse 7, God said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. And then he goes on in verse 10, and he says, Now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring out my people from Egypt. So Moses finds himself here, this issue, this problem staring him in the face. And that was that God had put a call on his life as a deliverer. And because of some past failures in Moses' life, he is now again facing the exact same call that was on his life over 40 years ago. But see, he was supposed to be the deliverer. But he had made an attempt to do that and it didn't work. So now he's found himself... 40 years later, face to face, again with the same calling that's on his life. You see, the calling of God, the Bible says that it's without repentance, which means you can run from it, 
but you can't hide. You can flee, but you can't get away. You can try to pretend that it's not there, but that does not mean that it's not there. Every person in this room, every person watching online, there is a call of God on your life. I don't know what it is, but there's something specific. And no matter what you do, that thing is going to be there. It's going to be maybe quietly, but it's going to continually call out to you. You can try to cover it. You can try to run from it. It's there. But Moses now has a decision to make. What's he going to do? And so if Moses, I think if Moses was to come down out of the stands and run with us for a lap, our life, here's what I think that he would say to us. I think that he would say to us to abandon safe and live by faith. I think that Moses would say to, if he could run a lap with us, he would say, listen, when your problems overwhelm you, you need to abandon safe and live by faith. Because there's this sense all through Moses' life that he had the opportunity to play it safe. I mean, he grows up in the house of Pharaoh and he finds himself in the lap of luxury. And that had to be pretty nice, you know? You're not just the son of somebody who's wealthy. You're the son, if you will, in the home of a king. That had to be pretty nice. But he chose to not let that be the thing that defined him. He finds himself later in his life out in the desert. And, and I'm sure that at that point, you know, he had, he had built a family. He had, he had a wife. He had a job with, with father-in-law. He had some relationships. He, and he could have just been settled in to where he was. It was safe. But he abandons it because he knows that there's a call of God on his life. He didn't abandon his family, but he abandoned safe. And I think, I think maybe what Moses might say to you and me is, abandon safe. Step out. Live by faith. See, I think there's going to be something on the inside of every single one of us that wants to play it safe. But I'm saying that that safe place is a dangerous place. And so I, I think that faith or safe will keep you trapped in the past. Safe will. See, Moses had the opportunity to recognize, look, I've already tried to do this and, and it didn't work out too well. And, and I don't want to do this. That's what he was thinking originally. And a lot of us are trapped in that exact same way by our past. The enemy has convinced you that because you have done something wrong, you made, so, you made a mistake, you have eliminated the will of God in your life. And some of you had, have had bad things happen to you, and you now wear this idea that that has to be a part of your life forever. And I just want to say to you today that that does not have to be a part of your life anymore. I mean, it'll always be there in the sense that you'll recognize that you went through it, but it no longer has to be something that is chained to you. Because Jesus came to break the chains off of us, to turn our wounds into scars. And on that day, when we see him face to face, we'll be able to see the scars and what happened to him on the cross. But they won't be wounds. Because see, wounds are alive, but scars are no longer alive. And the enemy wants to convince you that your past will always be a wound. That you'll always be marked by it. And I'm here to tell you that you won't. In Isaiah 43 and verse 18, it says this. And I love how the message paraphrase says it. It says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. God is. See, God wants to do something brand new. And it, he says it's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I am making a road in the desert, rivers in the badlands. And listen, I want you to know that you do not have to be chained to your past. Moses killed an Egyptian and they hated him for it. But that didn't have to be him for the rest of his life. Whatever the enemy has tried to do to enslave you, I want you to know that you can be free. I mean, Holy Spirit bolt cutters are here and he wants to separate you from that past if you will choose to let him do that. Safe will keep you entrapped in the past, but if he can't keep you there, then the next thing that he's going to do is he's going to try to keep you satisfied with today. See, if any, if any of us have experienced any freedom, there's this idea that comes into our mind that's like, you know what, I could just be satisfied here. I mean, and satisfied not so much as content because the Bible says contentment is a good thing but the danger of satisfaction is that we get complacent in life all of a sudden things are just you know and I think I'll just settle in here this is nice but see the thing is, is that God didn't call us to settle 
In complacency, we quit learning. Because in order to learn, we have to change. If you're going to learn something, we really have to change something. Now, we can name, gain knowledge and not change anything. That's why people can study the scriptures and amass all kinds of knowledge about facts of the, the Bible, but still be a jerk and not have the love of God. But to learn who God is requires us to move. And if the enemy can't keep us trapped in the past, he's going to say that the past is now over. Why don't you just stay here? This will be comfortable. And Moses had two opportunities to do that with Pharaoh and in the desert. I pray that we're all just a little bit discontent with where we are. Just a little bit of looking around at life and going, is this, this can't be all. This can't be everything. I mean, are you satisfied with your marriage or do you want to go to another level? Are you satisfied with your family or do you want to have a purpose for your family? Do you have a holy discontent? Because if not, safe will keep you satisfied with today. But if the enemy can't keep us satisfied, then what he'll do is he'll put us into a place where we're afraid of tomorrow. So we've, so we've dealt with our past, so maybe you've gotten free from that, and you're not satisfied in where you're at, and you're moving in a direction. But let me tell you that if the enemy can't get you with one of those two, he will keep you afraid of what tomorrow holds. See, something that God has for you is bigger than your capacity. And at this point in his life, I, you would think that Moses, when God called him from the burning bush, Moses might say, hey, look, I already tried that. I tried to deliver your people and it didn't work. And what's it going to be like if I try again? I mean, don't you understand that they're going to laugh at me if I go back? That I'm not welcome there? They might even kill me. I mean, I have abandoned Egypt and I don't think that they're going to look kindly if I just show up. So what's he going to do? And so here's the thing is if we are going to pursue God, we've got to abandon safe. We've got to be willing to get beyond that. And in Exodus 4.13, here's what it said. It says, but Moses said, pardon your servant. Please send somebody else to do this. I don't know if you've ever said that, but I've said that. Yep. And in fact, listen, if you've ever said that, you're in great company because even Jesus said that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was crucified, he prayed and he said, God, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any way that anybody else can do this, if there's another way that we can do this. I mean, but here, the, the end of his prayer was this. Not my will, though, but your will be done. You see, safe is a place that will keep us from stepping out into where God wants us to be. I don't know if you've ever done anything adventurous, but in order to really live life, you've got to take a few risks. You've got to take some risks. That's faith. And so safe is that place where you'll feel kind of comfortable. But listen, years ago, uh, Jamie and Tammy and I all went skydiving together. And safe is a place when you're in the airplane and you've got the parachute on and you're attached to the person behind you, just a little too close, by the way. And then they open that door... And you look out, and there's like 13,000 feet of nothing between you and the ground. Safe is the place that says, you know what? I don't, this is a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> you know what? This is good enough. I paid my money. I got to put the chute on. And you know what? I got to go on a plane ride. I think this is good enough. Let's go home. <laughs> Safe is the opportunity the, faith is the opportunity for adventure because if you're going to live life, you've got to have some risks. And I'm not talking about living careless, but safe is, the, is, 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 that, is that place that you, that you stray from faith. That, yeah, I want to make a difference in the lives of the kids in my school. I really would like to see my marriage different, but I don't want to, I don't want to make myself vulnerable, you know, because I want to stay safe. Because the enemy wants to keep you afraid of what tomorrow looks like. And I'm telling you that some of us, we need to take a step of faith. We need to take the plunge. And you probably know what it is. If there's something that's in your heart that, that keeps bugging you while I talk, that's probably what it is. Some of us are afraid of what tomorrow holds. I'm telling you, tomorrow or it holds the same thing as today, which is God being there saying it's all going to be okay. And I, and I think that Moses would tell us that, listen, to live by faith and not be safe, we've got to realize God's already at work. That God is already at work in us. And to follow this process of abandoning safe is not a natural process. It's not easy. 
But if we begin with the thought that God is already moving in our behalf, it makes it much easier. So what we've done is, so let, let's say we've forgotten the past, we've, we've become discontented with today, and we're not afraid of tomorrow. So the next thing that we have to do is that's going to help us to step out and realize that, listen, God's not surprised by today. God's not surprised. He's already been here. He was here a long time ago. There's nobody in this room here by accident. There's nobody that arrived today that, uh, listen, it's not just casual circumstance that you're here. God has planned it out to utilize today for your benefit. Here's what it says in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. Now, that's not like, you know, that general kid thing when we all look at our kids and say, that is not an ordinary child. That's my child. They're amazing. That's not what this is. This is, this is where it actually, they, they knew that to, to call Moses, that there wasn't, it wasn't just that he was a good looking kid. It was that they knew that something was going on. There was something special. There was a calling. And guys, there is something amazing. There's a calling within your life and on your life. Every single person here. And it says that they weren't afraid of the king's edict, the Pharaoh. If you're going to live by faith, you've got to understand that God is already at work. He's working it on, on your behalf before you ever even came to be in this world physically. It's no mistake that you're here today. And it's no mistake that God is speaking to you today. I want to give you a, um, a definition of supernatural. I think supernatural is anything that God can do for us that we can't do for ourselves in and of our own strength. You see, I can't save myself, but God did. I can't heal myself, but God did 2,000 years ago. That God is ultimately in control and he has the ability to help out where I can't do anything. And that's a great place to be because he loves us and he's already at work in us. Sometimes we're afraid to take a step of faith because we're wondering, is he going to go with us? But he can't go with you. He's already there. Did you know that God is infinite, omnipresent, which means that he's in every place and every time. 20 years from now, he's already there. And so you and I trying to figure it out that t t figure out today doesn't change the fact that he's already there tomorrow. And if we just walk and be obedient, he's going to be there through with us through the whole thing. So we don't, we don't want to live safe anymore. We want to live by faith, live by the supernatural. I want to look at people that I know don't know Christ. And I want to believe that, you know what? This person is going to know Jesus personally. I want to see the divorce rate in Raleigh go down. But in order for that to happen, I have to recognize that God is already at work. And he's speaking his, he's speaking his word. And I have to agree with that with my mouth. Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 says this. That by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. See, he, it says the next verse, the next verse, it says, He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Listen, if we're going to live by faith, we have to refuse to be defined by anything but God. It says he preserved because he saw him who was invisible. We've got to refuse to be identified by anything. See, a lot of us, we think that we're, we've been labeled because of our past or what, we've been, or what we've done in the past. And you're just thinking, you know what? I'm just always going to be that way. My grandmom was, my dad was, my great-grandmom was. This is who I am. And I just want to let you know that that label does not define you. Because you, listen, we need to have a label that says we are a child of the king. In Revelation, it says that he has put his name on our heart. And it's not based upon your past. It's based upon how he sees you. And every time that you're tempted to see something, see yourself as something other than through his eyes, the question I ask today is what is the king, the lower king, king the Pharaoh, who is that that's trying to define you and who you are? Maybe the job you do. If I do a good job, I'm valuable. If I don't do a good job, I'm not valuable. And obviously you want to do a good job, but does that determine your value? It shouldn't. That we allow God to be able to say things over us that we believe to be true. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. 
And so, and listen, even the people in, the, in your life, stop saying what you notice about them and start saying what God says about them. That your spouse, if your children, maybe it's your parents, start saying what God would say about them and you'll begin to see it. We have got to refuse any labels that this, this earth would place on us or the people that we love. We've got to receive the label that God put in us. That if we're going to live by faith, we've got to make sure that we do not allow our lives to be defined by this world that you live in. It'll destroy you. So God sends Moses to Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives the message to Pharaoh. Or Moses gives, you know, let my feeble go. And God sends plagues on Egypt. Pharaoh won't let him go. And so... Regardless of all these plagues and all the damage and devastation that it does to Egypt because Pharaoh won't let him go, Pharaoh continues to refuse to let the Israelites go. And even his own advisors think he's lost his mind, that he's crazy. But through the last plague, Pharaoh actually loses his firstborn son. And so he's compelled to finally let the Israelites go free. So the Israelite slaves, they make their exodus from Egypt. And so, but no sooner do they leave that Pharaoh changes his mind. And he gathers the, most, the strongest army on the planet at the time and he chases the Israelites for a final showdown. So Moses finds himself up against it again. The sea on one side and Pharaoh's army closing in behind him. And so there Moses is with 600,000 men plus all the women and children. So literally there were millions of of people and they all have their livestock and their flocks and their herds it has to be the most chaotic insane thing you've ever seen and they're trapped so Moses prays to God and God tells him raise your staff up over the water and when he does that the waters part and these millions of Israelites along with their flocks and their herds they cross over on dry land and God puts a huge pillar of fire to block, to block the Egyptian army so they can't get to them. And as soon as all the Israelites were the other side, the pillar of fire moves and the Egyptian army pursues them down into this dry ground that's in the sea. And as soon as they get into the sea, the whole sea swallows them up. And the most powerful army on the planet at the time is wiped out. And the Israelites are saved. And this is the culmination of all of this. Is to live by faith, you will impact people around you as well. See, how could Moses have known his, the amazing impact that his act of obedience would have even on us today as we sit here and learn from him? See, we have the limitation of time, but God has no limitation. He sees eternity. So when Moses was obedient on that day, a whole generation was saved. A whole future of an entire race was saved. And when that sea parted and that dry ground appeared and they, and they walked across, people's lives were changed forever all the way from there to here. Your act of obedience will change the destiny of somebody. And it'll change the destinies of a lot of people. See, some of us, you, we're standing at the edge of the sea and we feel like that everything's closing in on us and we need the, the water to part. And here's what I'm telling you. Step out in faith and the water will part. Step out today. You have to abandon safe to live by faith. And you know, sometimes when you lay down at night, there might be something that's on the inside that it's not irritating, but you know, you just sense that it's a burden in a good way. It gets your attention. Maybe that's the voice of God asking you, step out in faith. What's he asking you to do? I don't know. But in order to get there, we have to abandon safe. Is that right? What would you stay?